Hello everybody and this is the 32nd chapter of this wonderful book called The Short History of the World by H.G. Wells. It's a classic book and we are doing this in the series of great books, 32nd chapter. Uh, we have 60 plus chapters and this chapter is called Rome and Carthage. So let's start. It was in 264 BC that the great struggle between, the Rome, between Rome and Carthage, the Punic Wars, began. In that year, Ashoka was beginning his reign in Behar and Shi Huang Ti was a little child. The museum in Alexandria was still doing good scientific work and the Barbaric Gauls were now in Asia Minor and exacting a tribute from the Pergamum. The different regions of the world were still separated by insurmountable distances and probably the rest of mankind heard only vague and remote rumors of the mortal fight that went on for a century and a, half, and a half in Spain, Italy, North, North Africa and the Western Mediterranean between the last stronghold of Semitic power and Rome. This newcomer among Aryan-speaking peoples. That war has left its traces upon issues that still stir the world. That war has left its traces upon issues that still stir the world. Rome triumphed over Carthage, but the rivalry of Aryan <coughs> and Semite was to merge itself later on in the conflict of Gentile and Jew. Gentile and Jew. Our history now is coming to events whose consequences and distorted traditions still maintain a lingering and expiring vitality in and in and exercise a complicating and confusing influence upon the conflicts and controversies of today. The first Punic War began in 264 BC about the pirates of Messina. It developed, uh, it developed into a struggle for the possession of all Sicily except the dominions of the Greek king of Syracuse. The advantage of the sea was at first with the Car um, Carthaginians. They had great fighting ships of what was hitherto an unheard of size. Quinquereams, galleys with five banks of oars and a huge ram. At the Battle of Salamis, two centuries before, the leading battleships had only been uh, triremes with three banks, but the Romans, with extraordinary energy and in spite of the fact that they had little naval experience, set themselves to outbuild the Car Carthaginians. They manned the new navy they created chiefly with Greek seamen and they invented, gra invented grappling and boarding to make up for the superior seamanship of the enemy. When the Carthaginian came up to, the, to, to ram or shear the oars of the Roman, huge grappling iron seized him and the Roman soldiers swarmed aboard him. At Mile 260 BC and at Ignomus 256 BC, the Carthaginians were disastrously beaten. They repulsed a Roman landing near Carthage but were badly beaten at Palermo, losing 104 elephants there to grace such a triumphal procession through the Forum as Rome had never seen before. But after that came two Roman defeats and then a Roman recovery. The last naval forces of Carthage were defeated by it, by it last Roman effort at the Battle of Aegatian Isles 241 BC and Carthage sued for peace. All Sicily, except the dominions of Hero, king of Syracuse, were ceded to the Romans. For 22 years, Rome and Carthage kept the peace. Both had trouble enough at home. In Italy, the Gauls came south again, threatened Rome, which, in a state of panic, offered human sacrifices to the gods and were routed at Telamon. Rome pushed forward to the Alps and even extended her dominions down the Adriatic coast to Illyria. Carthage suffered from domestic insurrections and from revolts in Corsica and Sardinia and displayed far less recuperative power. Finally, an act of intolerable aggression. Finally, an act of intolerable aggression. Rome seized and annexed the two revolting islands. Spain at that time was Carthaginian as far north as the river Ebro. To that boundary, the Romans restricted them. Any crossing of the Ebro by the Carthaginians was to be considered an act of war against the Romans. At last, in 218 BC, the Carthaginians provoked by new Roman aggressions did cross this river under a young general named Hannibal. 
one of the most brilliant commanders in the whole of history. He marched his army from Spain over the Alps into Italy, raised the Gauls against the Romans and carried on the Second Punic War in Italy itself for 15 years. He inflicted tremendous defeats upon the Romans at Lake Trasmere and at Cannae and throughout all his Italian campaigns, no Roman army stood against him and escaped disaster. But a Roman army had landed at Marsilis and cut his communications with Spain. He had no siege train and he could never capture Rome. Finally, the Car Carthaginians, threatened by the revolt of the Numidians at home, were forced back upon the defense of their own city in Africa. A Roman army crossed into Africa and Hannibal experienced his first defeat under its walls at the Battle of Zama. 202 BC at the hands of Scipio Africanus the Elder, the Battle of Zama ended the Second Punic War. Carthage cap capitulated. She surrendered Spain and her war fleet. She paid an enormous indemnity and agreed to give up Hannibal to the vengeance of the Romans. But Hannibal escaped and fled to Asia, where later being in danger of falling into the hands of his relentless enemies, he took poison and died. For 56 years, Rome and the shorn city of Carthage were at peace. And meanwhile, Rome spread her empire over confused and divided Greece, invaded Asia Minor and defeated Antiochus III, the Seleucid monarch, at Magnesia in Lydia. She made Egypt still under the Ptolemies and Pergamum and most of the small states of Asia Minor into allies or as we should call them now, protected states. Meanwhile, Carthage, subjugated and enfeebled, had been slowly regaining something of her former prosperity. Her recovery revived the hate and suspicion of the Romans. She was attacked upon the most shallow and artificial of corals, 149 BC. She made an obstinate and bitter resistance, stood a long siege and was stormed, 146 BC. The street fighting or massacre lasted six days. It was extraordinarily bloody. And when the citadel capitulated, only about 50,000 of the Carthaginian population remained alive out of a out of a quarter of a million. They were sold into slavery and the city was burnt and elaborately destroyed. The blackened ruins were ploughed and sown as a sort of ceremonial effacement. So ended the Third Punic War. Of all the Semitic states and cities that had flourished in the world five centuries before, only one little country remained free under native rulers. This was Judea which had liberated itself from the Seleucids and was under the rule of native Maccabean princes. But by this time it had its Bible almost complete and was developing the distinctive traditions of the Jewish world as we know it now. It was natural that the Carthaginians, Phoenicians and kindred peoples dispersed about the world should find a common link in their practically identical language and in this literature of hope and courage. To a large extent, they were still the traders and bankers of the world. The Semitic world had been submerged rather than replaced. Jerusalem, which, had, which has always been rather the symbol than the center of Judaism, was taken by the Romans in 65 BC and after various vicis vicissitudes of quasi-independence and revolt was besieged by them in 70 AD and captured <coughs> after a stubborn struggle. The temple was destroyed. A later rebellion in 132 AD completed its destruction and the Jerusalem we know today was rebuilt later under Roman auspices. A temple to the Roman god Jupiter Capitolinus stood in the place of the temple and Jews were forbidden to inhabit the city. And that completes this extraordinary story and chapter 32nd chapter in the next video we'll come to 33rd chapter the growth of the roman empire